Good evening, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's uh, wonderful to see everyone out here. We are going to have the, the service setting one, and we will go ahead and begin with our opening hymn, which is 966. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. 
Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. O God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. Almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for our reading. The Old Testament reading for tonight is from Ezekiel chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are also impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with the first verse. I must go on boasting, Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. 
Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the hallelujah and the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please. Hi, everybody. I have a few things that I'd like to brag to you about today. It's true. Did you know that I am incapable of folding a fitted sheet? It's true. I have no idea how they get them to fit nicely in the packaging or how you can fold them so they fit in your linen closet. I also am terrible at making pie. They just don't turn out. They're disgusting. If you want a pie, you need to talk to Gary. He's the one who's great at making pie. I also have horrible upper body strength. I can't do pull-ups and I'm not very good at push-ups either. 
These seem like weird things to brag about, don't they? We don't tell people about the things we can't do or the things that we're bad at. We don't share our weaknesses with others with pride. And yet today in our epistle lesson from 2 Corinthians, that's exactly what Paul is doing. He's boasting about how weak he is. He's bragging about the things he can't do. And why is that? Why would Paul want to brag about being weak? Well, when we acknowledge and recognize that there are things we can't do, then we get to shine the spotlight on someone else. God. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. We want to be able to do things ourselves, but we can't. We need God's help every single day. It is a gift that he has given us this life to live. So when we brag about being weak, that means we can also show how strong and amazing God is in our lives. Because it's not about us. It's about him. Will you join me in prayer? You can repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for making us with weaknesses. Because when we are weak, then you are strong. May we always point others to the amazing things you do for us. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I have something to admit. I'm not a big fan of parades. Maybe it has something to do with the crowds or all the waiting around, or maybe just because I had to march in so many of them in high school for marching band. I don't know, I just never really have liked parades. 
On the other hand, I do find them fascinating, though. I mean, there's something about gathering together around a common interest that causes a, a little community to spring forth where before there were only cars driving by with individuals closed off to and secluded from one another. So it is an interesting sight to see, a, a strange phenomenon. It's a glimpse of community that one finds less and less these days. Parades, especially ones on Independence Day, are a fascinating display of Americana. For a while, people mill around waiting for something to happen, and then suddenly, everyone springs to their feet. Sometimes people will take off their hats, they'll put their hands over their hearts. And why? Well, it's because the flag is passed by, or the national anthem, or something else about America to honor. It never ceases to amaze me how patriotic Americans can be. How people who lead different lives, and maybe in some cases have opposing opinions, can be brought together in civic pride. Somebody will see a military person in a restaurant and they'll, they'll buy his dinner. Others wear shirts and pens colored red, white, and blue to show their patriotism. At hearing the national anthem at a ball game, people will stand up and show respect. Well, the vast majority of them will anyway. Just like at a parade, people will stop in their tracks to show honor. And why not? God teaches us in Romans chapter 13 to give respect to whom respect is owed and honor to whom honor is owed. When people take off their hats and they hold their hands over their hearts, they say the pledge, they sing the national anthem, we know that they're not saluting a piece of cloth, but rather they're showing their admiration to that for which it stands, for our country, and for all those who've risked or gave up their lives for our country, for our freedoms, and for the cause of liberty and justice. So it's good and it's right and salutary that people should stop and salute and support such sacrifice. After all, it is that blood-bought freedom that we are enjoying right now at this very moment. The freedom to gather together as a community around God's word and to receive from him gifts of forgiveness and salvation. Americans tend to be full of national pride and civic piety because of the liberty and injust injustice that we enjoy. But I have to admit that it concerns me that for many Christians, their patriotism tends to outshine their faith. People are quick to discuss politics or promote the American way of life, and yet those same people have lost the excitement and the joy and the wonder of what it means to be a Christian. To be one who is not only the possessor of political freedom, but one who has liberty from sin and death. Several years ago, the musical artist Kid Rock released an album entitled Born Free. And the title song, it's a celebration of the American landscape, the sense of constant adventure, and, and the chorus is simply the words, I was born free. When he was asked about the song, Kid Rock said that, well, I started to just think about no matter where someone was born in this world, how lucky you are just by the grace of God to be born free. We as citizens of the United States have every right to be thankful to God for the freedoms we enjoy. And although we as Americans may very well be born free in the political sense of the term, we as human beings are certainly not born free. We are born sinful enemies of God. We are born bound to a desire to sin. We are born to a life apart from God, controlled by our fallen natures to make mistakes against one another. In Psalm 51, we read about this condition. It's written, surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So we are not born free at all, but rather enslaved to our weaknesses and our wicked desires, and we cannot save ourselves. 
in John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to a group of believing Jews, and he tells them, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and it's the truth that will set you free. And they responded, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now, of course, they're ignoring their current oppression by the Romans. They forgot all about the enslavement of their ancestors in Egypt. So on many counts, this, this statement was wrong. But they were wrong on a greater level, too. As citizens of the United States, we fall into that same type of thinking. We, we fall into that, that idea that we can't see past our present condition. We take for granted that we're politically free, but we do not see that which really threatens our liberty. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. So while we constantly concern ourselves with asserting, protecting, and praising our political freedom, why do we pay so little attention to our bondage to sin? Freedom in all things is something that as Americans should certainly resonate with us. The first Pledge of Allegiance, written in 1892, simply read, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And that's all it said. In 1923, they added the words, the flag of the United States. In 24, they expanded it a little bit more. They said the United States of America. And it was all the way in 1954 that they added the words under God. But although the pledge itself has undergone small changes over the years, what has remained constant is the idea that each and every American has a right to liberty and justice. But even according to the political use of those terms, we know that liberty and justice come at a great price. They've been handed down to us, protected by those men and women who've gone on before us, fighting for our liberty, giving their lives in the cause of justice. So as you know, it isn't as easy as being born free, because freedom, as they say, isn't free. So it is with our condition before God. Patrick Henry once famously said, give me liberty or give me death, but without being set free from sin, death is the only other choice. Death is the wages of sin. And like the freedoms won for us by the blood of American fighters, our freedom from sin and death must be won for us as well. Won for us through blood. And the guilt that we've inherited, as well as the penalty we deserve, well, they must be satisfied, because God is just. Isaiah wrote that the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. In our case, we're so enslaved to sin and wickedness that the blood of millions of people would still not be a worthy enough sacrifice to reconcile us to God. Nothing that we could do or sacrifice can make up for our rebellion. So therefore, it was only by his mercy that God has given us liberty, freely through the blood sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Justice has been served, but not on us, we who deserve the punishment, but God took it out on himself, out of his love for us. And so now St. Paul can write, who shall bring any charge against us? It is God who justifies. And so we should render not only respect and honor to those who, by God's hand, have secured for us earthly freedom, but we should also render respect and honor to the creator of all things, who rescued us when he could have just as easily destroyed us. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Jesus says, the slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. What joyous news! 
that this Independence Day, as our fellow citizens celebrate the freedoms of being an American, we Christians get to celebrate not only temporary political freedom, but eternal freedom. Freedom from the temptation of sin and from the sting of death as we look forward to everlasting life with God in the new heavens and the new earth. A while back, a poll was taken of Americans asking that if they had to live in any country beside the USA, which country would that be? Now, the majority replied that they would move to Canada, our friendly neighbor to the north. Second to that was Australia, and third was the United Kingdom. But in thinking about that question, maybe we're thinking too worldly. Which kingdom would really be best in which to live? Because of Christ's sacrifice, you are now citizens of two kingdoms. The kingdom of this world, ruled by God through governments, a kingdom that will one day fall away and be no more, and the kingdom of heaven, also ruled by God, but one that will last for eternity. Liberty is important in both, but freedom from sin and death is everlasting. All the more reason to be as fervent about the freedom God gives us as we are about our worldly freedom. It's all the more reason to be glad for the gospel of Christ as we are for the benefits of American life. We have so much more to celebrate than those who do not have Christ while at the same time we have so much more responsibility to share with them this greater message of God's liberty and justice. What a great gift that God gathers us together around that life-giving message, that in this place springs forth a community built not on the works of men, but upon the sacrifice of God. I pray that each and every one of you takes to heart the forgiveness that God gives you here, May each and every one of you reach out in love to those around you. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, empowered by the gospel message, can, we can bring Christ to our community. So as you celebrate the 4th of July with your families and your neighbors, be sure to give witness also to the freedom that Christ has given you. As you're out in the community or shopping in stores, give others a new reason to celebrate. And so, may God be with you as you all serve as revolutionaries of Christ in the cause of eternal liberty and justice. And for that, may God give you his peace. So, may that peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, keep you steadfast. Amen. Land of the free. 
Although we face some problems at home and far away, America stands for freedom, and we're still proud to say. Time will now sing the offertory. Please stand as we now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for endurance as our Lord leads us through a hostile world that rejects his Christ and shows no honor to his wisdom or church, that we would not lose heart, that the Holy Spirit would steal us for opposition, and that we may rest confidently on what God has said. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all preachers and hearers of God's prophetic word, that the great and mighty work of God to create faith in Christ's eternal blessings by his Holy Spirit would continue, that God would remove all stubborn ears from our midst, and that Christ would not leave us without his word, but make his home among us and restore the joy of his salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the home, that God would soften hearts, turning parents and children toward each other in love and patience, and that he would banish the spirit of impudence, stubbornness, and rebellion from all. Let us pray to the Lord. For our nation, that it may be defended against its enemies. For our leaders, that they may be preserved from temptation. And for the work of all civil authorities, that we may be enabled to live quiet and peaceable lives according to his word. For this let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those whose pain is chronic, whose sustained suffering is unknown, for those who wrestle with difficult thorns in body or mind, and for those who are tempted to despair, we especially lift up Yvonne and Judy and Flo and Jim and Dee. And we lift up the family and friends of Ruth Romling, and we also lift up the family and friends of David Ducey, that they may know that in their weakness they are strong for the sake of Christ, whose grace is sufficient for every need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our brothers and sisters, Brian and Angela and Noah and Emma and Dan and Dawn, for Brenda and Flo and Carrie and Kenzie and Darren and Becky on their special anniversary, and Daryl, LaVon, Alex, Jim, and Vivian on their special birthday. For them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For courage and weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, 
to boast in Christ and his cross, by which we and our sufferings are sanctified. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We are bold to pray that prayer which our Lord himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. We conclude our service this afternoon with hymn 965. Good evening again, and, and welcome once again. Again, it was wonderful to have you guys out here. I hope you have a wonderful uh, and restful 4th of July tomorrow. Um, the only announcement I have to make is that we will not be having Bible study tomorrow, tomorrow because of the holiday. Um, so if you are doing any traveling, I pray that you stay safe. And other than that, um, go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I was just going to make one quick announcement. I know I said my last thing, but um, for those of you who may not get the information, uh, we will be having a funeral this Wednesday for Day Two Ski. It's going to be at 10.30 here. Uh, Tuesday evening from between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. will be the visitation, and you're all invited to both of those things. Okay, thank you so much.